genocide. The fight is that the blood of a thousand men and women was filled in these laws. Limbs twisted and broken. Eyes gouged from bloody sockets. Flesh burned black. What's up, guys? One hour early tonight with our special Halloween special that we're running late on, but hey, we don't care, you don't care, we understand. Uh, tonight, we've got a lot of crazy stuff here. We've got interviews with the cast of Sinjin Smith, actor Kevin Gage, Heat, Blow, G.I. Jane, D. Snyder's Strangeland, The Burbs, and the old Werewolf TV series, if you guys remember it. John Philbin, Tombstone, Point Break, North Shore, Children of the Corn, Camden Toy, <clears throat> excuse me, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, Greg Travis, Toolbox Murder, Showgirls, Lost Highway, and Wade Wilson, sound designer for Ring 2, Madagascar, Elf, Hollywood, Homicide, 13 Days, Perfect Storm, Shrek, Futurama, and The Simpsons TV Show, among others, as well as also being the former drummer of Nine Inch Nails. Wow, that was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> How's it going, Chuck? Pretty good, pretty good. All right, well, for those of you who are too slack to read <laughs> and not know that we're on right now, that's fine because we will have the podcast up in parts. Um, Trent's not going to be joining us tonight, so it's just going to be me and the Chuck Meister. Here. Oh, yeah. That's right. Happy Halloween. <laughs> 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 oh, gosh. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, we've got some pre recorded interviews here. The first one is uh, with, um, gosh, who was the first one with? I can't, uh, there we go. First one's going to be with uh, Molly Stewart. And um, she is, uh, she runs a haunted um, tour in Salem, Massachusetts. And it's, it's really interesting. We've had her on before on Jay Scott's World of the Unexplained Guilford College Radio. She was my very first guest. So, really? Yeah, my very first one. At QFS, huh? Yeah, and she's still there now, and she's running, um, still running these old uh, haunted tours in Salem, Mass. Oh, that's awesome. You got her back then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So just a short one. She's coming back. She's scheduled for later in 07. And we've also got... Um, the guy that wrote the Monster Mash song, pre-record I did with him. Yeah, <laughs> that's remember. awesome. So uh, stay tuned, guys, and uh, check it out. We'll see you in chat room. You're listening to World of the Unexplained. This is Jay Scott, and tonight we have a special treat for you guys for our Halloween edition of World of the Unexplained. We have with us Molly Stewart from Spellbound Tours in Salem, Massachusetts. How are you, Molly? I'm doing great. How are you all doing? Oh, we're doing wonderful down here in this spooky time of year. It's pretty cold down here. I'm sure it's pretty cold up there. Oh, it is well below freezing. Trust me. <laughs> good old, uh, good old Massachusetts winter. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how is how is Halloween around there? Is it keeping you pretty busy? Yeah, uh, we are actually the Halloween capital of the world here in the Witch City, and so as we approach the final weekend of Halloween, the crowds get crazier and crazier and bigger and bigger, which is great for us. You know, we love the tour, ghost tour business, but um, it just gets a little hard to handle. No. Hard to handle. No, I noticed when I called the number um, before that I got a message saying if, if you wanted tickets right now, in this last weekend with, with Halloween coming up and everything, you got to get them right there. At, at the place. You can't get them online anymore. No. What we're trying to do is uh, prevent people from printing up online reservations and then just walking up to the tour with them from all over the country. Um, this is the first year we've offered online ticket sales, and we're doing phenomenal business uh, since uh, September, I guess. And that's great. And we can handle 300 people per tour Wow. You know, at any given time, on Fridays and Saturdays in October, we do the tours at 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and 10 o'clock to be able to bust up the crowds, to handle the tours, um, no problem. But we've gotten so many people ordering tickets <laughs> online, and they don't 
realize they're supposed to bring the PayPal confirmation to the museum to pick up their tickets in person. Uh, they're just showing up on the tours that it's just become this, you know, nightmare. Now, how many how many people? What's what's your been your biggest crowd this year so far? Um, 900 people on last Saturday night. Good Lord, and it's not even... <laughs> wow, now I want to mention to everyone, this is a pre-recorded interview, I'll mention that before I, I go into this anyway, but, you know, this is we haven't even gotten into the, the weekend before Halloween yet, we're, we're a week before that now, and I mean, right. 900 people, that's just amazing. Well, we're, we've been doing this tour for seven years now, and I have three excellent uh, paranormal investigators who work with me who are also trained as tour guides. I'm always the backup for the overflow on Saturday nights. So we've got it down to a science pretty much, but uh, we've just become so popular that uh, we don't even know sometimes how many people are going to come. <laughs> now, and one of the reasons you've become so popular is because you were voted top 10 among the ghost tours in America. Can you tell me more about that? Right. We were notified in September of this year, 2006, by hauntedamericatours.com that we were one of the top 10 ghost tours in America and we had gotten onto the website this summer and all of a sudden within a couple months we were climbing up the list of the top 10 and it's people who've been on the tour throughout the year whatever who go back home after the tour is over and actually go to hauntedamericatours.com and give us a vote or a shout out or uh, some kind of positive editorial and we are the only ones in Massachusetts. We are certainly the only ones in Salem, Massachusetts, to make the list. Well, that's so something we to brag about. <laughs> everybody's decks, <laughs> and our goal right now is to move up to the very top of the list. Wow, <laughs> that's so. Everybody who comes on our ghost tour, you know, we say if you like the tour, you enjoyed yourself, you had a good time, please go and give us a vote. So this is like a this is like a People's Choice Awards kind of thing, then. I guess so, and um, we're I mean, it's not, thrilled it's not, to get the honor. It's not like a critic a critic coming by and saying, okay, I like this one, I like this one, but, you know, I know so-and-so that runs this one down the street. Right. This is actually yeah. real people this coming out. An anonymously, you know, people who've been on the tour throughout the country. And, uh, of course, you know, I've done tours in New Orleans for years. I sold that company, came up to Salem, Massachusetts in the year 2000 and worked very hard to create a different kind of company we do not uh, want to take people to locations that have no ghosts or hauntings. I personally have done the investigations inside every building, such as the old abandoned jail and the burned-up jailkeeper's house and the side of the True Witch Dungeon, so that we can document and prove the ghosts are still active from 1692 in the 18th century. And being a licensed ghost hunter with the International Ghost Hunter Society, you know, I'm I'm scientifically investigating these places. I'm not a psychic. I'm not a medium. I'm strictly a scientific investigator. So it's really thrilling for us when we have people on the tour who maybe never even took a ghost photo in their life. We teach them about ghost photography. We have had some phenomenal photographs from our customers the entire month of October. Wow. Now, for those of you that don't know, Molly Stewart was my actually my first guest back in college on Jay Scott's World of the Unexplained on uh, Guilford College Radio, and that is still up in the archives. Um, I need to polish it up a little bit, but if you guys want to check that out, do so, please. It's at the very top of the list on the archives link. Um, also, I want to remind you, too, that Molly's actually going to come back with us for a full night on January 29th, 2007, and she's going to be here to take your calls live from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, and so we'll be pumping that up because she's definitely going to come back, and uh, she'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions and also talk about her book ghost among us um how's that selling for you molly um i only have two boxes left out of five thousand books <laughs> wow okay <laughs> uh, apparently very well <laughs> yes yes well i self-published so trying to cut a few corners there but uh yeah people uh love the book because it teaches them a little bit how i got into ghost hunting how a ghost saved my life in college before i got into this professionally and my ghost hunts in New Orleans, where I lived for eight years before I came to the Witch City, um, Alcatraz Prison, places around Salem, Gallows Hill, of course, which is where they 
hung all those unfortunate victims in uh. 1692. Still doing ghost hunts up there with my beautiful Akita <laughs> Renfield, the world's only ghost hunting dog. And there's a picture of him on our site with you. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, you can go to our site. It's uh, listed on a link with ours, but it's uh, spellboundtours.com. That's www.spellboundtours.com. It's in Salem, Massachusetts. And can you tell us the newest attraction you've added, the Ghostly Parlor? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. Um, I wanted to do something a little bit different in town. Uh, it's a 25-minute ghost story I recorded in the studio with all the special effects, the music, the sounds, the lighting. Everything's been done for you. We mm. did not want to have any actors in this show. It's not a haunted house. No one jumps out of the dark. But it's based on a, a haunted mansion in New Orleans from 1825 that was part of my ghost tours for five years. It has just a a horrific history and I took that ghost story and created some other ones and combined them all together to have a 25 minute ghost show so you sit down in our gothic parlor the lights come down you're sitting there you know looking at the fireplace and just a few things and things light up in front of you the voodoo artifacts the hatchet the diary <laughs> there's a ghost in the room all this stuff unfolds in front of you but you're sitting there in the dark, and your imagination fills in the most horrific details, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that was an expensive. we had a woman run out uh, last night, five minutes into the show. Oh, my gosh. Because she has a doll phobia. And one of the props, <laughs> just sitting in a chair, is this god-awful, hideous doll that we created. It does not move or speak or anything else. But I didn't know that her father collected porcelain dolls when she was a child. And when she goes to sleep at night, he would put knives in their hands and place them around her. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy dearest, right? Wow. No wonder she's got a doll psychosis. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's no refund. You run out crying, whatever. <laughs> There's is, no refund. Is that the first one to run out crying from the ghostly parlor? <laughs> no. Oh, no? <laughs> oh, God. But it's the first one I've encountered with a doll phobia. I thought that was very strange. That is. Oh, man. No, I mean, it's, it's a very gothic, atmospheric tale, and people like it because it's, it's just so well done. With uh, The, the storyline's very good, and the artifacts are very creepy, but nothing moves. There's no animatronics and certainly no live actors. Okay. But it's, it's getting a very good reception here. Now, our uh, co-host, Trent Lackey, actually came up with his, uh, at the time, his newly newly uh, wed wife, uh, Cora. And uh, I, I heard that you showed them around and they had a great time. So uh, we're definitely... Uh, we're he definitely... mentioned you and I went, uh-oh, here comes trouble. <laughs> uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I, I had just opened the ghostly parlor in the summer and uh, so he was one of our earlier guests and he seemed to enjoy it very much. Oh yeah, he had uh, he, bride. Oh he had, yeah, he had. They had both of them had rave, rave reviews to, to, about it. So uh, I was Good. definitely interested in getting you back on here. It's been a while since you've been on, and I know right. we can't talk long tonight, but uh, we're definitely looking forward to January the 29th when we can have you for the full two hours. Oh yeah, I've been uh, doing ghost hunts at uh, Gettysburg and some other places, Ooh. and I'm hoping in December, early January sometime to get over to England and Scotland to do some more serious ghost hunting. Oh, wow. You know, a friend of mine's actually, um, he's a filmmaker, and he does a lot of uh, he does a lot of filming out near Gettysburg because he lives near that area near D.C., and he's, uh, man, he's picked up some really, really strange stuff out there. I mean, yeah. sounds and all, just all kinds of um, anomalies as far as, you know, orb, orb stuff and, I mean, just amazing stuff, and he's been showing it to me, and it's just really, really freaky. I was uh, very fortunate when I went in January. I took Renfield, my Akita, with me on a uh, on a weekend trip for a full moon to go out on a Saturday night <laughs> to the battlefields. And I just happened to run into some other ghost hunters that Saturday day, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, at a place called Saks Bridge. And they were telling me, oh, this is very famous because they hung some deserters in this bridge from the rafters. I'm going, okay. Oh, yeah, he's, he's mentioned Saks Bridge to me before, actually. Yeah, well... So I'm taking, the ghost hunters took off, so I, you know, took some pictures and broad daylight by myself, and then Renfield and I went to a big field by the river, which they said was haunted. I didn't see anything with the naked eye, but when I got my prints back, the uh, inside of the, the rafters inside Saks Bridge was just 
almost completely obliterated by this white ectoplasm, which is now, those photos are on display at the Spellbound Museum in my ghost gallery. So I was very oh. pleased about that. That's great. Well, let's. Uh, I want to wrap this up, but um, sure. I want to thank you for, for coming on to World of the Unexplained again, and we're looking forward to having you back on the 29th. But tell us now, I know you've got a new video out, or I guess it's, it may be older now, but I know it was new at the time we talked last. Um, is that still available for sale at SpellboundTours.com? Yes, uh, Ghosts of Salem. That That's actual footage from the tour, ghost photos. Uh, we teach you about ghost photography on it. It's real footage from the tour years ago with one of my other investigators named Sage, who's no longer with us. Don't uh, worry, he's not dearly departed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he just went on to greener pastures. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Well, Molly, thank you so much for being with us on our special Halloween edition of World of the Unexplained. Okay, my pleasure. Happy Halloween. And uh, if you guys stick around, we'll be right back. After this, you're listening to World of the Unexplained. This is Jay Scott. We're talking with Bobby Boris Pickett, the writer of the Monster Mash. How are you doing today, Bobby? I'm doing fine, Jay. Thank you for digging me up. <laughs> How are things out there? Uh, well, uh, I'm in a different spot now. I'm uh, I'm on Cape Cod. Oh, really? In Massachusetts, yes. Uh, when when did you do this? Um, about a two hours ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're really busy this time of year being uh, the I'm, Halloween. Yeah, I'm swamped. I'm doing a lot of interviews and uh, I'm working and I'm doing a lot of traveling. So uh, now I, I looked, um, I did check on your tour schedule and it looks like you've got three dates coming up. Can you tell us yeah, about that? Yeah, possibly four. Uh, there are a couple things pending for Tuesday night, which is uh, a bad night for Halloween, but uh, there's always somebody out there willing to celebrate. Oh, yeah. So now, do you, you perform the Monster Mash song, I'm assuming? What, what other I, stuff do you I, do? Yes, I perform a medley of my hit. Okay. Is, uh, do, you, do you have any other songs that you perform along with that? or? No, sir. I have the shortest act in show business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I'm assuming this medley is, a, is an Almond Brothers kind of thing where it lasts 15, 20 minutes, or is this just a straight deal? Um, you mean the show itself? Yeah. You can't do much with three and a half, a song that lasts three minutes and 20 seconds. So I talk for about uh, 40 seconds, and I fill out a good four minutes. Okay. How which, uh, some, which some promoters find very irritating and others love. <laughs> well, I think it's awesome. Thank you for coming on our program. My I, uh, pleasure. I wanted to ask you. I, I'd read some articles about how you came up with this song, you and uh, you and an, and an old band member of yours, uh, Lenny, and uh, how you were sitting by the piano and it just it just came to you because of your old impersonation that you did of Boris Karloff. Can you tell well, us how that we, started? Yeah, we pretty much knew what we wanted to do when we met uh, that Saturday morning at his house. We had already discussed the uh, possibility of using that voice and Lenny being the horror film freak uh, uh, that he was, like myself, um, it was just something that, you know, we were both very uh, in tune with, and it wrote itself in about a half hour. Wow. Well, you know, some of the best songs do write themselves very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's amazing. Um, I used to tour with Megadeth years ago, and um, I know some of our songs came up, you know, two, three minutes. We were, we were done. We had an entire song, and it's usually the best ones come out that way. Yeah. Um, I've heard that you... Um, that you did all the sound effects yourself for this uh, song. Can you tell us about that? Well, no. Gary Paxton did the sound effects, actually. I did all the voices. Okay. But uh, Gary Paxton, the producer and arranger of the song, Gary had sang Alley Oop with the Hollywood Argyles previously and was a uh, flip of Skip and Flip. Oh, wow, really? Huh. And he was the hottest young producer. He was 19 years old. And uh, he called Leon Russell to play on the session, and Leon was late, so Leon played on the B-side, Monsters Mash Party. <laughs> I remember listening to the, um, I, I used to have the old record when I was a kid, and I would listen to it over and over again during Halloween. I thought it was the greatest thing. Yeah, yeah, little kids seem to love it. Yeah. <laughs> now, what what kind of, uh, you know, this, this thing reached number one um, several times, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken. No, it was on the charts three times. It charted three times over a period of uh, oh, maybe 12, 13 years. It charted three times. 
which is kind of unusual. Oh, that's amazing. I heard that you did a re-release around 2005 to uh, fight global warming. Can you tell us about that? Um, that yeah, well, that was not re- that was hyped as a re-release, but all that was was a public service uh, spot against global warming. It was not a, a recording in any sense of the word. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, a, a, um, uh, a standard recorded song. I didn't write it, and I was commi- you know, I was commissioned to do it, uh, and uh, I barely remember it. But I just remember because um, I'm, I'm I'm concerned about global warming and also about you know rainforests and all that environmental stuff. <laughs> so um, I had no problem doing it, but it wasn't. It wasn't a, uh, in any sense of the word, a re-release or a recording, in in the true sense of the word. Now, what um, what got you into, what, what made you a horror fan? Where did this start for you? That started when I was about uh, seven years old. My dad used to manage movie theaters in uh, uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, and uh, they used to show uh, all those Universal. Real art re-releases with Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff and Lon Chaney, and uh, I was just uh, enthralled, and I just would sit there and watch them over and over again. Those guys, and are Boris the... Karloff, was an impression I've done since I was about eight years old. <laughs> Those guys are definitely the masters of horror. I remember uh, Universal when they re-released. I don't know if you remember this a few years ago, The Wolfman yeah. and Dracula and, and The Mummy and all these older films. Yeah, uh, just just really good stuff. Uh, poor Bella, I mean, uh, dying with with nearly not a penny to his name. It was yes. just uh, that was a, that was a raw deal. Did you see Ed Wood? Yeah, I did actually. I did actually. That was a great performance by Martin Landau. Oh yeah, that, that whole movie's really good actually. Yeah. John, Johnny Depp did a good job as well. It was a uh, very good film. Very good film. Now tell me about about your Boris Karloff. Now I know you've met Boris Karloff. No, I've met his daughter. Oh, you met his daughter. Okay. See, my facts are all over. Uh, <laughs> Boris Karloff died in uh, the late '60s. Okay. Um, he did hear the hear the record, and uh, his daughter Sarah told me last year. My father loved the record when he heard it, but he said, "I don't think it sounds a bit like me." <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Well, at least he loved the record, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, most most people don't don't know what they sound like, but he was an accomplished actor, and uh, I wasn't really doing him, you know, on on the nose. I was doing a cartoony version of him. Yeah, well, it sounds good. Exaggerated, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, for humor purposes. But it, it sounds good, and it's uh, it's it's like I said, definitely a great recording. Now you've been in films of your own as well, haven't you? I've been in a few uh, obscure, low-budget movies. Yes. What uh, what were those? Oh, let's see, Beast, uh, no, no, um, uh, Deathmaster. Okay. With Robert Quarry as a vampire, and I did a movie called Chrome and Hot Leather, which sounds like it's a porny <laughs> film, but it isn't. <laughs> it was about motorcycles. <laughs> what, what what pray tell did you do in that film? <laughs> I played a um, uh, a biker. Mm. Okay. That's when I had long hair and a beard, and I was a hippie. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, good. Now, tell me, how, how does this, uh, you've got this one song, I noticed on your website you've got a trading cards available for sale, you've got photos for sale, all kinds and of... And my book, yes, I've just written my um, autobiography. When did, when was that finished? Um, several months ago. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about your book then? Well, the book begins when my parents met and brings us right up to date, telling the whole story of Monster Mash and how it was created, and a lot of kiss and tell and name <laughs> dropping. Oh, good. Now they can get that book at your website. Would you, would you mind giving us your website? Yes, the website is the t h e monster mash dot com, mm. and you can download um, the actual recording onto your iPod or cellular phone as a ringtone right off of the website. Oh, that's amazing. Awesome. I'll definitely have to check that out. TheMonsterMash.com, folks. Yeah, T-H-E in front of Monster Mash. All right, now, now let me ask you another question. I've heard a rumor, and you don't have to confirm or deny this. I will. Uh, I, my life is an open book, Jay. <laughs> All right. Well, you might not want to answer this question, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot it. anyway. I have heard a rumor that the Monster Mash has played so many times on the radio around the around the months of Halloween, around October and around the Halloween time, that the residuals alone from just the 
the me- I guess the mechanical royalties, I guess is what you would call them in this case, the royalties you get from the radio play is enough to pay over $30,000 per year to you just for that one time a year. I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Okay. <laughs> but I can say that it has paid the rent for 45 years. Wow. How many times does your song get spun in, in, around October? Do you, do you know? Just... Oh, lots. Uh, lots. And, and the ringtones are doing, I mean, the downloading of the ringtones has uh, helped pay the rent uh, more into the future. <laughs> okay. And hopefully the book sells well as well. Yes. Now, do you write, are you are you still currently writing any songs? Are you doing any songwriting? No, now? I'm kind of um, just uh, in October. I get dug up once a year. And <laughs> for the past two years, I've been going uh, to the Chiller Theater Convention in Secaucus, New Jersey, okay. with John Zacherly, who made a record called Dinner with Drac back in the late '50s, and also covered Monster Mash wow. in the '60s. And uh, he and I and Pee Wee Herman, Paul Rubens, <laughs> and Elvira, and Adam West and Burt Ward, and a whole bunch of old celebrities and semi-celebrities like myself, we hang out and we bring all our memorabilia to these conventions, sign autographs, and uh, they get a lot of people. They get about 10,000 people a day, and I'm doing that for three days in uh, just before Halloween of this year. Wow, Elvira, the Mistress of the Dark, is still around. Yes. Oh my gosh! Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. So these these conventions take place every year in the same place? Uh, yes, in Secaucus, New Jersey, usually at the Crown Plaza Hotel. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I, I'm sure you've met a, a load of uh, wonderful fans of your music and and of everything. Well, like yeah, that. I get a kick out of it, and I I also get a, a pleasure out of meeting some of my. Uh, uh, you know, co-workers in the uh, entertainment field. It's fun. Definitely. Well, what's what's uh, what's coming up in the future for you? Anything on oh, the horizon? Say, uh, this coming weekend in Secaucus, New Jersey, uh, PBS is doing a little uh, special on uh, Monster Mash. Um, we're going to tape that in early November. It's a 60s retrospective, and they're going to include that, so we're looking forward to doing that. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you uh, taking your time to come on World of the Unexplained. My pleasure. Now, I I hope everything's been explained. (laughs) We hope so, too. Thank you so much. You have a safe and happy Halloween, Jay. (laughs) You do the same. Okay, that was fun, wasn't it? Oh, that was a riot, man. (laughs) (laughs) The Monster Mash. Okay, as I explained earlier, Trent is not here with us tonight, unfortunately, and most of this stuff's pre-recorded, so if you guys want to jump in chat with us and our friend Alice Gar, you can do that uh, by going to worldlyunexplained.com uh, and uh, clicking on the chat button, or chat room button. Yeah? Oh, yeah. You're talkable tonight. Talk, talk to, <laughs> talkable, talk, talkable Chuck. It must be being on, you know, an hour early. I just, I haven't got my mojo on yet. It's okay, man. The mojo's coming. Ethan Dettenmeyer. <clears throat> it's going to be on with us. We try to get the guy from uh, Corpses for Sale, and I, I, I think I wrote down the number, and um, I don't remember where I put it, though, and that, that's mm-hmm. usually not me, but I've had so much craziness going on here the past few weeks that I've just kind of lost um, lost track of some stuff. So um, anyway, but we're going to get him eventually if we don't get hear back from him tonight. We may. We, we may hear my <laughs> We might hear back from him tonight. We may hear back from him tonight. And if we don't, you know, that's fine. We'll, we'll bring him on sometime in the future. Uh, you can always call us here at 877-722-7382. That's uh, 877-SCARE-U2 for all those of you that don't want to remember um, all those numbers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, our next interview is uh, is God, Chuck. Our next interview. Uh, I just noticed something on the board, man. I, it had me distracted. Uh, uh, okay. Well, the next interview we're gonna play is with John Philbin. I did this uh, a few days ago. He was in Tombstone. He was also in Point Break. He's actually known for Point Break and North Shore. And he was also in the Children of the Corn film. Oh, creepy. Man. So uh, this is Kevin Gate. Um, I'm sorry, John Philbin. I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm looking ahead too now. This is John Philbin <laughs> and uh, on World of the Unexplained. Check it out, guys. And you're listening to the special Halloween edition of World of the Unexplained. Tonight I've got another treat for Halloween for you, and this is with actor John Philbin from the new upcoming film, Sinjin Smith, directed by Ethan Dettenmeyer. How are you doing tonight, John? 
I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. It's a little chilly out here. How's the weather out there? Well, it's kind of overcast out by the beach, but it's I, it's warmer than anywhere else, apparently. <laughs> a poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, for those of you that don't know, John has been in other movies as well. He's no... Uh, He's no newbie to the horror films. He's been in Children of the Corn in 84, and he was also in Return of the Living Dead in 1985, and he's done a few other things, uh, which we'll mention later, some surf movies that I definitely want to talk about. Um, tell us about your experience with Sinjin Smith, though. Well, I had uh, been talking to Ethan Detmeyer about doing a, a movie for about, almost half a year before Sinjin Smith came up and we were trying to put it together and all of a sudden he got funding or got a, a green light for Sinjin Smith and asked me if I would participate in that and I said I would participate in any capacity. I just wanted to work with him and for him and I trusted his taste in you know, action and horror and film so I just uh, showed up on the set one night you know, after I got back from this exact trip in Mexico I think that I'm going to take tomorrow and uh, he just threw me in a costume and gave me a character name and gave me some guns, some weapons, some huge weapons and some <laughs> firearms and told me to blow the shit out of some shit at this camp. I love up in the water thing. And I had a ball. I showed up on the set and I saw all these, like Kevin Gage, all these really cool, great actors that he had assembled. And I was just um, kind of impressed with the company I was surrounded by and all the weapons we were holding and carrying. And it was a nobody got hurt I mean, everybody got killed but nobody got hurt and so uh it went that's what we call a, a good day so what was what was uh how did you first meet ethan deadmeyer he just called me up he was on the warner brothers lot and he was thinking about doing this cop this kind of old rogue cop he's probably still going to do this movie he got roddy piper and me and a couple other guys and you know interested in playing these 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 old you know, drug-addled alcoholic cops on a <laughs> rampage, and we all loved it. It was funny and full of action, and he's working on that script. When we all were kind of like got to know him, he's, you know, he's a likable guy, smart guy, he's got a lot of energy, and, and while he was in development on that, he got a green light for Sinjin Smith, and I think he called up all his actor pals that were going to work with him on the next film, and we all kind of said, yeah, sure, we'll do that now. We'll do this one now and that one that later. And, so um, you know, I just stayed in touch with them, and then we shot this film, and we've stayed in touch since then. Done some radio interviews, done some press, done some horror conventions, done some inter internet publicity, and uh, it's been a good time. I like him, you know, and his whole family, actually, Loda and his beautiful little girl. So it's just, <laughs> it's fun working with him. I want to make some more movies with him. He's got a lot of energy. I like I like his style. So you, you basically signed on without reading the script? Yeah, I had. To, I wow. still haven't read the script. No, I've, I've read it now. But I joke that I've never. I don't know what, why. What's it about? What's the movie about anyway? <laughs> I know I get killed. When, but uh, uh, yeah, I signed on without reading the script. I had just come back, and he's going. Can you sh can you show up at the Warner Ranch? tonight and work all night and i just said yes <laughs> and uh i'm lucky my timing was great because had i been home from mexico i think one day earlier and said yes i would have shown up and i would have had to have been hung by the neck until i was dead and that's something i'm really afraid to do have a rope around my neck and nothing under my feet they hung this poor actor by the neck from a tree and he he made the shirt and i'm really happy for him but i just don't ever want to get hung <laughs> so i got shot in the neck by a 45 i think that was that was Ooh. not so bad <laughs> so what was it like working with rowdy rowdy piper on this film god that guy's just who doesn't like that guy man i, I wish i could it was awful that guy's <laughs> So he's mean. He's not. He's not nice. I mean, yeah, sure, he's nice to his fans, but he's mean to other actors. No, it was great working with him. The guy's just got a lot of energy for, for an old dog. I can't believe what good shape that guy's in and what he was able to do on the set. Really, it made me feel like I had to get back in the gym. Ah, uh, come on he's now. A charming man, you know. Everybody loves him, and he loves everybody. And I think that's uh, he's got that quality that, that is hard to come by in an actor, especially. But I think it's his training and from wrestling and stuff. It's his training. And I don't know, it's just his spirit is good. So I feel lucky to have ever worked with that guy. You know, he's a legend. And, God, you should see him at the conventions, man. <laughs> I mean, he's got a huge following, and he doesn't have a – and he's great about that. And so it was really fun and educational, and I was honored to be on the set with him. Wow. Now, did you, uh, did, did you do any scenes with uh, Richard Tyson? I'm assuming you did. 
Yes, I did. I tried to kill him in my first scene. <laughs> I was trying to shoot him until he was dead, but he evaded all my shots oh. like, while he was smoking. He is the coolest <laughs> movie star I have ever tried to kill. I love and Richard Tyson. I've tried Tyson. to kill a few. <laughs> Richard Tyson has a movie star quality that is as good as any movie star I've ever seen. That guy has got it in spades. And so I tried to kill him. He, I, I didn't manage. And then at the end of the night, after a lot of work and stunts and stuff, at the end of the night, he came up and said, like, one thing to me, and I was flustered. I didn't know what to say. And then, and then I think he shot me in the neck. <laughs> just like that. Like, like he, he just he didn't even think about it, really. And that, I think, ends up in the movie. It's really insulting and <laughs> hurtful to me. But I don't care. I've been, I've been killed by some greats. Oh, Richard, Richard's a great actor. I saw him in The Visitation recently, and I just thought that was just a... Great movie. I don't know. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it yet. Oh, man. Go, go check it out. It's at the video store now. It is a great film. He does a great job. He plays a police officer that's got a brain tumor. It's really uh, really great acting. Really good cool. stuff. Now, um, let's see here. I wanted to ask you about some of the other... What about Jenna Jameson? Now, what, what, what does she do in this film? I don't know. Looks okay. good. I, I, I didn't get to work with her. We were we were outside shooting guns, you know, all night. And I don't know what she does in this movie, but the fact that she's in the movie is good for the movie. So Definitely. I can't wait to see it now. I hope I get invited to the premiere. <laughs> I hear you. It's fun to meet her. How did you like working with Gary Casper? Oh, that guy's great, man. Another great training ground. I used to watch him, you know, and doing some of his stunt fighting. And it's not really stunt fighting. The guy really is a superb athlete and funny. And he surfs, and he's just amazing looking. I like that guy. I really had fun working with him. I hope we get to do some more scenes together because we're basically on the same assault team in the movie. And I think we might have some flashback or before you know we die scenes that need to be shot and they'll hopefully get to shave his head again and dye it and that'll be fun to watch too are there are there any good guys in this movie besides the devil that's funny that you think the devil's a good guy <laughs> the answer if you think that way is no oh okay All there right. are no good guys in the movie Okay. Well, let's 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 talk a little. Let's get off topic for a little bit, and let's talk about some of the surf stuff you've done. Oh. Now, I, I know you've been in one of the greatest surfing movies ever made, which was, in my opinion, which was uh, Point Break. Yeah, um, Point Break is a good one. Some people may argue that that is really a buddy cop movie, cops and robbers movie set in a surf. It's got a little surf milieu in it. I think one of the greatest surf movies ever made is The North Shore, which I'm in as well, or Big Wednesday which I'm not in, but I did just have the privilege of working with Gary Busey on this last surf movie I produced, actually. It's it's a documentary. It's called Chasing the Dream. Okay. And it's we produced it for Quicksilver, me and this extremely talented director, Angelo May, who uh, is really going to be something. He's directed a fantastic movie called Chasing the Dream, and I have attached Gary Busey as the narrator, and Gary did a fantastic job. Gary was the masochist in Big Wednesday, which is a cult classic, and then Gary and I worked together on Point Break. That's how I know him, and uh, he lives right down the street from me, and we got together and collaborated together and worked on this documentary, Chasing the Dream, which really kind of makes a great trilogy of surf films going from the past to the present to the future, and he's fantastic in it. But, uh, yeah, Point Break was a blast. I was really, again, lucky to be involved in a production that took me to Hawaii to surf Pipeline twice and work <laughs> with all those great actors. Now, you, you teach surfing as well, don't you? Yeah, I started teaching surfing about six years ago, and I travel around. I teach in Malibu when I'm here, and then I'm going to Mexico tomorrow to teach uh, for a week, and then I go to Hawaii in the winter and teach surfing in Hawaii on the North Shore during the winter time. and then I come back in the summer. So do you, do you ever, when, when, you, when you ever meet some of your clients, are they like, uh, do they do the Keanu and like, whoa, oh my God, it's, you know, it's John Philbin you know, from Point yeah. Break, dude. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes they do. Sometimes that's, the, they, 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 they're keyed into that and sometimes they have no clue and sometimes uh, they'll take lessons from me because of that. It depends uh -huh. how they found me and how much research they've done and how into it they are if they're into the internet and they or they've uh checked out my website i'm pretty you know open about everything i've done that's why i charge so much money I okay. always, I, people are like what well, why do you and i go well just here's my website i was in point break <laughs> go to my website check out my stuff and then call me if you're interested so what, what <laughs> yeah, is what is your website break, just being in point break 
buffs up your salary, your hourly rate, you know, by 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 100 percent. I bet. What what is your website? Go ahead and give that to everybody. It's www.prosurfinstruction.com. R O S U R F I N S T R E C T I O N dot com. Now, do you do you people go, can find me by Philbin dot com too? No, will you but, go? Will you go anywhere to teach? I will not go anywhere to teach. I guess I'm a big whore. It all depends on how much <laughs> money I'm getting paid. Like, say somebody you know, from I, say somebody from Florida calls up and says, you know, John, you know, I, I've seen your site. I really want to. I really want you to teach me how to surf. Can you come out and you know to Florida and teach me how to surf? Yes, we can arrange that. I, I will. I will travel for surf. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. I, I am. Everything is negotiable. What is? What is the? What's been the? In your opinion, what's the best place to surf? What Indonesia, without a doubt. Really? Bali, Indonesia is the best place to surf. The, and the best place is, you know, in particular near Bali is Geeland Surf Camp in Java. Okay. Well, what about in the United States? United States. <laughs> um, Hawaii fun place to surf. I like it a lot, but a lot of the guys in Hawaii, they'll go to Indonesia in the summer, too. Uh, where I live in California, the best place to teach surfing is down where I do in Malibu at Cross Creek, but I think that Southern California's got a surf spot called Trestles that's pretty pretty great, pretty great for learning right near San Onofre, and pretty great for pro surfers to surf lower Trestles, so you've got it all down in San Clemente. I don't know. What, what got you started in surfing? Oh, I, I was, uh, I grew up in Palos Verdes, and my dad taught me how to swim, and the counterculture kids that didn't, couldn't play football were, were <laughs> surfing, and that's what I got into, and uh, I never left it. It's just been great to me. I really, really had a good time. It's taken me all over the world a couple of times, and I've had, I've done great movies because of surfing, and I've gotten great movie parts because of surfing. I've, I've met my heroes and, and my idols, you know, that I had posters of on my wall since I was a little kid. Wow. I've met them and I've worked with them out at the best wave in the world, which is Bonsai Pipeline on the North Shore of Oahu. And that's probably, and that's happened a couple of times over because of, because of my commitment to surfing. So it's, I've, I've been in, I've gotten to surf Pipeline in character for three different Hollywood productions with world-renowned local legends, and that's been a real treat for me. It's been an honor and a privilege, and that's probably what I'm most grateful for in my life, besides my girlfriend, who I love dearly. That's awesome. Now, I want to also mention that you've been in Tombstone, which is mm. a, another classic film. Uh, how, was, how was that? Was that a lot of fun to make? Yeah, we were out in the Tucson, Arizona desert for three months. It was about 110 degrees, and I was working with these I guess I love all those guys, you know, Terry O'Quinn and Sam Elliott, Bill Paxton, Val Kilmer, Kurt Russell, who's a great guy, really nice, Billy Bob Thornton. I mean, I, I had so much fun, Jason Priestley. I'm not the best cast of, of any movie I've ever seen. In fact, when they published the cast list, I just went around and went, this is the best cast list ever assembled for any movie. Wow. And it was, because if you look closely at it, it's got, you know, every cool dude ever, ever, ever worked as an actor. And it's <laughs> really, we had a great time, you know, we're shooting guns and riding horses. It's fun to play cowboy, you know, but some of those actors are so darn good that it's, uh, I don't know, again, I'm just blown away sometimes by the people I've had an opportunity to work with. Now, I'm going to bring up something close to home here that you probably don't get a lot, but, uh, you know, a lot of talk about anyway. Uh, and I may be wrong. I don't know. Correct me if I am. But this this hits close to home because, uh, you know, we're in North Carolina. We're based out of North Carolina. But uh, the Black Widow murders, the Blanche Taylor Moore story, this happened in our backyard. I see that you, uh, you played in the uh, miniseries for that. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, based on a real story. That's right. That was yeah. horrifying. That, that, <laughs> that, that true story is horrifying. I played one of the kids whose dad was murdered by this woman, and I think I knew it, and it, she was just awful. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the actress that played her was from Bewitched. She was like a real seasoned TV actress. It was funny to watch her work, man. She's a real pro. What's, I noticed you did some Law & Order. You've done a lot of TV stuff, and you've done a lot of film. What's the difference between the TV stuff and the film stuff? I mean, is there a different feel to it when you go on the set? Is it? I mean, how does it, how does it relate to one another? Yes, they are different, but I guess it all depends on the specific crew you're working with. But 
generally speaking, television moves a lot faster. They have to film a lot more dialogue in a shorter amount of time than film. And people who are making films, you know, they, they take a year out of their lives at least wow. and commit to this material, to one, you know, 115, 120-page script. So they've put a great deal of thought into every shot, you know, and how things are going to work and the casting and the relationships and what they're trying to say with this movie. So... You know, it, it, and it also has, you know, secondary and tertiary, you know, characters going on with the environment, everything's so much important. Whereas television generally, just by the nature of the medium and, and the, the distribution of it, is talking heads. A lot of times you're just, there's no subtext in television. You're just saying exactly what you mean, and someone's seeing your face say it, you know, because that close up sells. And then they use, you know, music to tell you what to think, and then they cut to a commercial. And I think a, a lot of actors are like, they do television because they're lucky if they can get it. I wish I could get it if I, and I would, I would be on a TV show. I think there's great TV shows now. In fact, uh, things have changed. That that what I just said is kind of how it was about maybe 10 years ago. And now, uh, you know, a lot of movies they make at such a low budget that they they and they they run through them real fast and they throw them up and they hope it makes a big weekend. Then it goes right straight to DVD. And TV has been is getting created by some. You know, really brilliant writers who, are, like David Milch, for example. You know, HBO says it's not TV, but I mean, it's on TV, so <laughs> you have a lot of close-ups of heads talking. But this writer, David Milch, is so brilliant that you know, I'd do anything for him. You know, I'd be a f guy picking up sticks in the background <laughs> for a, for a TV writer and producer like David Milch. So it's, it's gotten that, sick, TV though. It's gotten much better. I it's, think. it's gotten sick. I, I think TV's got. I'm gonna have to disagree with you on that, John. I think TV's gotten worse, and, and the reason I say this is because there's so many reality TV shows, oh, God. And, and it's just killed the market. You know, I mean, they don't want to pay actors anymore. They don't want to pay for syndication. I don't know what the problem is, but you're getting so much crap, and it's just flooded the market. And it's like every time I see a reality TV show, I, I just want to scream. It's like, why can't we get back to good dramas? Why can't we get back to good comedies? Why can't we get back to good shows? You know, it's uh, it, it's just a it's sad when you have to turn to HBO to get what you used to get on the network stations. Yeah. Well, I don't. I actually don't have a TV hooked up, so all I ever get <laughs> are what goes, what TV series go to DVD, ah, okay. rent to Blockbuster. So, I don't know. Like, I don't have. I haven't had a TV in I don't know a couple of years, like five years. So, I and anything I know about TV is what I rent on DVD. And I've been renting. I've rented a couple of series, and I've gone, wow, this is these are great. But I mean, I don't watch television. So, I, but I have a TV with a monitor in my room, and so I've rented Deadwood, and I've gone. Oh, that's this great. Is a great show oh, yeah. what, and I've rented House and I really like that actor you know even though it's a formula I'm thinking no this is this is this formula is working for me I like that guy and I like some of those stories what else have I rented that I liked Weeds I went I rented Weeds I'm I think I'm familiar with that it's about Mar selling pot in the suburbs <laughs> it's really funny a really great you know actress in it I think Medium is really great Patricia Arquette and Medium you know, these things, you can rent them without commercial interruption and just Oh, it's watch. great. Yeah, it's very it's kind good. Kind of a writer's medium, but, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I'd go insane if the TV's on in a room. It's like, I have to talk back to it. And <laughs> it's, you know, the music's trying to tell me what to feel. And I'm like, F you. <laughs> I hate it, too. I'm with you. I hate it. Uh, you know, I, I hate the music industry, too. And I, I don't know. Tell me how you feel about this. I'll, I'll throw this in. I know years ago, it was, it was different in the music industry than it is now. Um, and I can only speak of that from experience, um, you know, and I'm sure it's the same way in the entertainment industry because the technology has expanded so much to where anybody can basically take a good, you know, you can get a good HD camera now for four or five thousand dollars. And with the software like Final Cut and stuff like that, you can put together a, a really nice looking film on your own at home. I mean, if you have the knowledge of the, of the programs and you have the knowledge of the equipment. Um, and, you know, just filmmaking knowledge in general, you can do this on a relatively low budget. Now, comparing that to what I see in the music industry on this end, you know, you can also go in and cut a CD on a relatively low budget. And I think that that's caused an explosion. Now, this, this is just, now follow me here, John. <laughs> this is, I think this has caused an explosion in crap being thrown out and, and, and being mass produced. I think you're, there's, because of the technological explosion, you've got more bands that suck. You have more movies that suck. You have more, and you, you know, I, I hate to say that because, you, you know, the, the politically correct answer here 
is, you know, oh, we've got these great opportunities for all these people to get out that may have had, you know, financial problems before, you know, so they couldn't do what, you know, what their, what their, their, their inner voice is telling them, their muse is telling them to do. Um, and now they're, they're ready to do it. They can do it because there is a lower budget. But at the same time, you just get all this crap with it and you just have to sift through it more, I think. What do you yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah, you have to be very selective about the entertainment you consume these days. There there is so much out there and so many ways to receive entertainment. I'm 46 years old. I don't know how to text message, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not so I'm not online either. So you know, I the way I consume entertainment is I go to the movie theaters and watch. You know, I I see a lot of movies, but I go to the movie theaters sometimes see two movies a day. You know, for, you know for the admission of for one, if I can afford it, I sit in the back row because I don't want some guy burping into the back of my head or slitting my throat or something or putting his stinky feet next to me or talking or like he thinks he's in his living room watching TV. Exactly. But I, I go and watch the actors and the filmmakers I've admired all my life, and I listen to reviewers, and I decide. I, I go, But I go see a lot of movies. And then I'll go to the Blockbuster, and I'll rent things that I missed and TV series that I missed that I think look interesting, and I'll watch the a couple of arcs of them and when it but when it comes to music i gave up a long time ago man i just listen to the radio i just listen to talk radio npr and uh talk radio i love you already <laughs> talk radio is a great medium it really is Who, what's yeah. your favorite talk radio talk course? radio this is, yeah we're on talk radio <laughs> that's right? right my radio i had to turn it off you know to to do this interview but my radio is on 24 hours a day. What's, who's your favorite? Who's your favorite talk radio personality? Well, uh, I like the BBC, which comes on where I am in Los Angeles at 11 o'clock at night, and okay. I listen to NPR in in you know I don't know I guess that's all over the world, but NPR in California is on 89.3. It's KPCC or KCRW, which is our LA station that has NPR National Public Radio on it. And I just, and I like Michael Feldman's What Do You Know, and I like even Garrison Keillor. Some people don't, you know, it's a little too folksy for them, but I just, <laughs> li- the radio's my best friend. Oh, that's awesome. And it's, it's intelligent and it requires me to think, and I just, it's not too, it doesn't make me into a zombie, but, uh, you know, and I love it. But speaking of zombies, like you said, anyone can go out and make a movie. I just finished a movie for a guy that did exactly that. He made zombie a farm, low-budget right? zombie movie called, yeah, <laughs> called Zombie Farm. Zombie Farm, and, uh, you know, he made it on uh, digital camera on the weekends, you know, and he got a SAG low-budget contract, and uh, I believe he's finished it and used the Internet to promote it, and I haven't seen it yet, but I think it should be getting released sometime soon. Is this going to be Zombie a farm. Is this going to be a straight, be to, straight to DVD kind of thing? or? Oh, yeah, I mean, a okay. shot DVD, you know, shot on a little, you know, those little digital cameras oh okay like like digital cut, tape you know probably on final cup like you said yeah but final cup pro got, or something he, yeah he did some interesting writing and he, he shot some good scenes i've seen some scenes in it that i really liked and you know if you like the genre of zombies which you know it's kind of got a built-in fan base uh maybe he'll you know recoup recoup his money and make another one you know maybe maybe he's one of the guys that's uh you know in it for the long haul you know, you know, I have a friend that went to film school. I was telling Camden about this earlier today, and he's uh, he's got an HD camera, and he's done just that. He's taken, and um, actually, uh, I'm in it. It's uh, he's doing a um, a thing on talk radio, uh, just a documentary on talk radio. Me and uh, uh, another friend of mine in Asheville, about three hours west of me, is in it at WWNC and WWPEK. There's a couple of radio personalities there, and he's interviewed all of us, sat in on our shows. He had like. I think when we totally counted, it was over like 25 hours worth of tape, yeah. and uh, he's he's cut it down now to an hour and 48 minutes. <laughs> oh so uh, yeah, and, and it looks great. I mean, I, I went and visited him in uh, Washington D.C. and got the Capitol in the background when I was talking about politics. I stood on the Exorcist stairs there at uh, Georgetown University when I talked about religion, you know, and different oh. things like that. And it, it was just really uh, so far what I've seen of it. I've seen the. Um, the, I guess you would call them a daily, I guess. But uh, what, what I've seen of it looks really good, and I'm really impressed with it. And from what I understand, Discovery's shown an interest in picking it up, possibly. But I think he really wants to go and get it screened and uh, transfer it to film. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it works out. But it's uh, it's amazing yeah. to see that. He, he did go to film school. He went to the uh, North Carolina School of the Arts. That's where he graduated out with his film degree a few years ago. So he's he's definitely wanting to do this for a living. I tell him to move out to L.A., but he just doesn't want to do it. So. 
Well, <laughs> well, you don't have to live out here now. I mean, I think going to film school is a great idea. You know, you learn a lot and you practice and you, what, you know, what you're studying and you make films and then you can go out and make films about things that are interesting and then I get to see movies that are shot somewhere else in the world besides L.A., <laughs> you know? I, 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 that's something I do like and I love documentaries and everyone's got ideas and they'll take me to a world that I have, would have no clue about and that is one thing I kind of do like about these, these cameras. People, you know, more documentaries are getting made about interesting subject matter that I I'm, you know, not exposed to. So I and I'll have to send you a copy. Non, I, I'll send you a copy. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so well, you know, what, what 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 do you see? I guess in the next in the next five ten years, where do you see yourself at, John? Jesus Christ! Five, <laughs> ten years. I, I try not to think about the future too much. I I'd like to get married to my girlfriend. I'd like to buy a big house in Malibu. No, I I I don't know. I'm going to Hawaii on November 14th for five months uh-huh. on this teaching job, and that is the that's the longest I've ever you know had to go away and and book a job. So I'm in the middle of a transition right now, and I. I, had, I didn't string it out to the five years. I'm just stringing it out for the next year. This is what I've got. This is all I've got. This is as far as I can think ahead. I'm going <laughs> to Mexico for a week. I come back. i got two weeks here. That's it, two weeks. I'm going to pack up, sublet my apartment out to my girlfriend's mom. Then I'm moving to Hawaii temporarily to teach on the North Shore for five months, you know, and my friend's going to have a baby, and I'm going to live over there, and that's going to be interesting. Then I'm coming home, and I'm moving to a trailer on the top of Los Flores in Malibu at the very top of the mountain, and I'm going to live in a couple of airstreams on this property that's going to be, uh, I don't know, developed. It's an old uh, nuclear uh, nuclear bunker. Wow. It's actually made out of six feet of concrete all surrounded like no and people have been tagging it for years. It was owned by the government for a long time, and then these architects convinced this owner guy to sell it to them. They're going to design this beautiful compound place, but it's got a, it's got, the bunker can't be touched, and it's got this huge radio tower on it that was designed to relay messages in case there was a nuclear you know, assault on, the, on Los Angeles. And you get a crawl up on this platform, and you can see the whole world. And I'm going to live up there kind of like Sean Penn did when he lived in his Airstream trailer at the top of Malibu. It's on the same streets. Right up for, it's right up from there, actually. And um, I'm going to change the world. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Um, <laughs> wow. That's my plan. That's as far as I've got. Now, if, let's say, 100 years from now, when we're all dead and gone. I'll so- still be alive up on the tower. <laughs> okay. Well, let's suppose 101 years from now. Okay. Uh, let's suppose you're dead at 101 years from now on got the it. tower. Got it. When people pick up a book and they look through it and they see all the actors in there and they come across your name, what role do you want to be most remembered for? God. Well, <laughs> I, I know the answer to that question. It's not necessarily what I want to be, but it's what I, what I am. I mean, I played a, a part of Turtle in the movie The North Shore, and, you know, people to this day... You know, I get emails every day from all around the world. They actually think I am that guy. <laughs> and, you know, there's nothing I, I, I try to fight against, it, but it's beyond my control. Not, you know, you, you, when you make a movie, you know, you do the best you can. You try to make a good movie. You never know what's going to happen. You know, and sometimes movies take on a life of their own through cable and television and, and, and video. And that movie, North Shore, took on a cult life that is beyond, you know, Return of the Living Dead or, you know, anything I've ever tombstone or point break or anything i've ever been involved in and i've been identified with that character turtle to to you know sometimes it's uh not even pleasant but 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 sometimes it's great it's just it's out of my hands so i think that i don't know i've got friends on the north shore that go john when you're dead you're still going to be a legend around here so (laughs) you know there's nothing you can do about that just accept it and enjoy it and and be grateful and i'm like okay um, I guess, what, is there anything else you want to say, John? Anything that, that we haven't covered? God, just a happy Halloween. I hope everybody uh, is safe out there and goes to the movies. Oh, yeah, definitely. We're definitely going to go see the film. And, um, wow, well, thanks for the happy Halloween, and um, we appreciate you coming on World of the Unexplained. It's my pleasure. I really look forward to maybe hearing this and seeing St. John Smith when it comes out. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, John. We appreciate it. Okay, Jay, it was really fun. Thank you. And that was Mr. John Philbin. Uh, right now we've got, coming up next, Kevin Gage. What's he died? What's he died? What? What's, what? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Gage uh, Kevin Gage has done um, 
a lot Sorry of things. To put you on the spot no, that's fine. There, man. He's done Heat. He was in Heat. Oh, that was an awesome film. And he was in G.I. Jane, a, a not so awesome I, I film. I have not seen that one. Uh, he was in D. Snyder's Strange Land. Uh, I, I I've seen previews for it. It looks very strange. He was like, in The Burbs. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, he was just like a cop. Okay. Yeah, so he, you know, no. That, that's a great film, film yeah. actually. That's great a wonderful Halloween film. film. Yeah. And he was in. Do you remember? Do you remember the Werewolf series from the eighties? Uh, not Teen Wolf, huh? No, no. not te- No, this is an actual television series that came on Fox. Uh, not offhand. I had no. a guy. I, I'm trying to get him on the show now. I talked to his agent the other day. There's a guy named John J. York. He played the role of. Um, <sighs> now, now, you know, now the name has slipped. The, the guy's name, the, the the character's name has slipped my uh, mind. But anyway, uh, it was a series. I think it only ran for about a season hmm. or maybe a season and a half, but it was called Werewolf. It came on, I guess, you're, you're about my age, aren't you, Chuck? You're about yeah. 30, you know? Uh, roughly. Okay, well, yeah, well, close <laughs> enough. It came on when I was in sixth grade. It came on on the Fox channel, and it was called Werewolf. It was in the 80s. Yeah, you you don't remember. It was really cool I, because I, I watched a lot of Fox, man. I, well, for the for the TV shows, one. I mean, for TV shows at that time, and there is an actual website out there. I think it's like WerewolfTV.com. But for the shows that came out, yeah, it goes through the whole <laughs> dedicated series. dedicated to it. <laughs> yeah, seriously, they used to have like live clips and stuff up. I don't think they still do anymore. But the thing was, I mean, to see to see the the special effects that they were pulling off back then on these werewolf creatures, dude. I mean, they looked really, really good for the 1980s. How, how many years was, was it on? It was, like I said, it was just on like a season or a season and a half. It wasn't on for long. I'm surprised I haven't seen it rerun, though, at some point on the Sci-Fi Channel over all these years. I don't I don't think anybody's ever bought rights for it. Because, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's not on anything. They're actually selling it, and I, I don't think it's legitimate, but they, if you go on eBay and type in werewolf TV series, you can find... Burn copies? Yeah, it, burn copies. I, I yeah. think, I, well, I don't know. I can't tell if they're burned or not that's why i haven't purchased any but it's i'm not sure if it's burned or not because from what i see it looks like some of them you know how people do they'll put them in official i've gotten so many things like that on ebay it makes me so mad i bought a copy i could not find phantasm two and three on dvd right so i buy them i'm like i see this like double dvd set online on ebay saying you know phantasm two and three for both like, on the same disc probably too no 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 no, no it was like two separate discs <laughs> but it was in the same case and i'm like oh it's like one of those double features of no, other horror like films the arrival one and two yeah or poltergeist one and two i uh, think that's on the same you know in the same uh, arrival box. was a bad example well yeah you know what i'm saying i don't even know what arrival <laughs> is but that's okay it's a terrible charlie sheen movie from what i hear oh well a lot of charlie sheen <laughs> movies are bad but you know so you're thinking okay well, well this is cool so i order it you know what it is this guy took the laser disc and burned it on a DVD. And the only reason I know that is, well, first of all, the qualities. I mean, I could tell it was a burned copy uh, when I turned it Laserdisc is actually an analog format from what I understand. Yeah, well, so. it gets like 425 lines of resolution. Uh-huh. A DVD, around 500. Right. But I, for the reason I know that he turned it, that he, that he did it that way, is because, well, first of all, you know, you look at the bottom, you see the blue, or the purple. Right, uh, yeah. right. The so line. you know it's burned. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the, <laughs> the case that he sent me, it's like printed on like a jet ink printer. Oh, that, that's good stuff. So the next time you spill something on it, you know, yeah, it gets, it'll, yeah, it it'll gets wiped out. Yeah. It was awful, man. I was so pissed. But, you know, I did get the movie. I still have it. You know, I paid for it. You know, but um, somebody's getting ripped on the copyright stuff there. That's a federal offense, mister, whoever you are, if you're listening to this. <laughs> Those poor guys that made phantasms are missing out. That's right. Royalty. Well, they, they have actually released that now in a box set that you can buy legitimately. So I've done that. <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah, you and you can get it out. But, you know, the, like the end of the last one, he cut the credit short because I was trying to look for somebody oh, in there. Oh, probably because he was trying to fit it all on the Yeah, probably the so. Disc. But <laughs> it says LD stop. So I knew it was laser because I own a laser display. And I was like, oh, oh that jerk, right? Oh, ah, well. Anyway, so we, we've got a. Uh, next up, we've got actor Kevin Gage. Like I said, from Heat, Blow, G.I. Jane, D. Snyder, Strange Land, The Burbs, the Werewolf Television series from the 80s, and now in Sin Jin Smith. So without further ado, here's Kevin Gage. You're listening to World of the Unexplained, the special Halloween edition. Tonight, we have actor Kevin Gage from Sin Jin Smith. Now, I also want to mention Kevin's done all kinds of crazy stuff over the years, and we'll talk about some of those, too. He was in Con Air. He was in, for some of you horror fans that listen to us weekly, if you remember the old TV series Werewolf, he actually had a role in that. And he's also done the movie Blow, one of my favorite films. Uh, just, just a lot of stuff that he's done in, in the past. And we're going to talk about Sinjin Smith right now. Here's Kevin Gage. Kevin, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jay. Thanks for talking with me. Oh, Werewolf. thanks for coming on the show. God, I, I actually forgot that I did Werewolf. That was 25 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you about that. How was that? Uh, that was great. I was, you know, a youngster. I think 21, 21 years old, 22 was one of the first 
first couple of TV shows that I got to do. So, uh, you know, it was all good, all good. What did you play in that? I, as I recall, it was, uh, I mean, I really don't remember the episode well. It's been so long ago. But I do remember uh, we were we were bikers in a, <laughs> in a diner. And, uh, God, I, that's, to tell you the truth, that's really all I remember. I don't remember the plot or anything. But it, it was a while back. <laughs> I got to uh, manhandle some little girl in a diner. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you still have the love of bikes, though, right? I do. I have a uh, 2002 uh, Harley Fat Boy. I've had many dirt bikes and uh, cross rockets. Uh, yeah, I love motorcycles. I'm slowing down, though. I'm 47 years old now and uh, got my first baby on the way. So, uh, Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I don't do all the crazy stuff I used to do on motorcycles. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> In fact, a lot of my crazy lifestyle is... Uh, mellowed out a lot no <laughs> and, more jumping out of planes no more uh, <laughs> doing major jumps on my snowboard no more jumping motorcycles no more heavy uh, alcoholic uh, party nights <laughs> oh come on now it's Halloween <laughs> well you know yeah, I, I gotta go out and blow it out once in a great while yeah <laughs> alright well tell us tell us about the role you play in Sinjin Smith the special agent Dax uh, Special Agent Dax, uh, <clears throat> he's uh, like a lot of the agents in the, this film. He's uh, ex-military, he's uh, special forces. Uh, he is an interrogation specialist, so uh, <laughs> I guess basically he is an inflictor of pain. Oh, good, uh, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. His, uh, his weapons of choice are a couple of sledgehammers so i think that pretty much sums it all up right there doesn't it yeah i guess how how did you like working with ethan dettenmeyer in this film loved it loved it ethan's uh ethan is great people uh, uh, he's, uh, he's a real family man and uh, we've become friends uh <clears throat> since the film he actually lives not too far from me oh great um, but not only is he just a, a really great dude but I think we're going to see a lot more of Ethan in the future. He's a uh, he's a very talented filmmaker. He is uh, he seems to have a very specific vision on what he wants. But uh, on the other hand, he also gives the actors uh, a lot of freedom to create their own characters and to improv and uh, to really you know bring bring their own characters to life, which is which is important to me. <clears throat> uh, I like working that way. Yeah, well, it gives you some input. Yeah, a lot of directors uh, are very specific about what they want you to do and how they want you to do it. And, you know, that, that works, too. Like, you know, Michael Mann is that way, and uh, uh, that works very well for, uh, for him and his films, and it worked well for me when I worked with him. But it's a lot more fun when directors give you the, the freedom to just uh, <clears throat> pretty much go do what you want to do. And not that Michael Mann wasn't like that either, but he was just much more much more hands-on <clears throat> but uh, Ethan uh, great guy had a lot of fun working with him and I think it's uh, going to be a very successful film when it's over <clears throat> now, what, what about I, I want to ask you about the movie Blow it's one of my favorites I've got it on DVD I watch that thing probably once a month at least it's, it's, it's one of my favorite films how was working on that I love working on that film and it, you know what it's one of my favorite films also <laughs> oh good <laughs> it really is I love the uh, the story and the uh, the soundtrack. It uh, it takes me back to that to to those days. I uh, I remember when all the cocaine came flooding into California and uh, uh, when we did the film, it was it was, uh, it was very interesting being being a part of that and, and understanding uh, where all that cocaine came from. <laughs> Uh, as far as the cast and uh, crew, they were all great. The storyline was great. Uh, the director, he was also one of my favorite people. And, uh, unfortunately, you know, he, he passed away not long after that. I was I was working with Johnny Depp. Is he a, is he as cool a guy as they say he is? Totally cool. You know, <laughs> he was really a great guy. Um, <clears throat> my experience. You have to excuse me. I've got a half a cold going. Here. Uh oh. <clears throat> I can't can't talk real well but uh you know he was a really great guy a lot of fun to work with very professional 
and um, like like most of the bigger movie stars I've worked with over the years, they're just they're just real everyday people doing their job. That's cool. That's cool. You know, you you hear a lot of stories, and, and especially in Hollywood, about people. You know, the, the persona they give to the crowd, and then the persona that they they actually exude, <laughs> and and it yeah. being two uh, conflicting things. So it, it's cool to know that there's some real people like yourself, of course, out there uh, doing what you do. Yeah, well, Johnny Depp is uh, definitely one of the one of the cooler people I've worked. Uh, real, real nice guy. Now, I want I want to talk about what you've got coming up. Um, it looks like we, we've got. Big Stand is in post production. Cosmic Radio, Chasing Three Thousand, and Sugar Creek. This, these are a lot of films here. Yeah, it's been a good year. I stayed stayed busy this year. I think I've done like six or seven movies. Uh, let's see, uh, Big Stand. That's uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's a Rob Schneider film. Uh, it, you know that that Rob Schneider kind of comedy. Uh-huh. It's not something I've had a chance to do over the years. Mostly I, I draw blood, rape, pillage, kill. <laughs> All <laughs> the know. fun stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get hired for the uh, for the heavies. Uh, uh, Big Stan was uh, a lot of fun because I, I really enjoy Rob Schneider's movies. Adam Sandler, uh, you know, that, that type of comedy. And uh, I was surprised when they hired me for, uh, for one of those comedic-type films. And... Uh, it started out as I was playing some uh, Aryan Brotherhood kind of guy, and after uh, a couple of table readings, he decided that he wanted me to uh, play a different character, uh, a uh, prison guard, Bullard. Uh, well, I won't. I won't give away the end of the movie. But okay. <laughs> a bigger role, a lot more fun, and I, I loved it. I, that was great working with Schneider and that whole gang, and uh, I'm looking forward to this one. Now, what is this six records that says it was announced and, and it looks like the role that you're playing is something called Snake Man? Snake Man, yeah, looking forward to this one. It's, uh, six records is a uh, film by Rob Hall. I've actually worked with Rob before. He's a friend of mine. Uh, I did Lightning Bug with him. Okay. And uh, six records is... Uh, actually, you know, I think Rob Schneider may be attached to uh, six records also. Huh. I'm, I'm not positive, but if I had heard that. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, that's still in uh, still in development, so I'm not sure when that's going to happen. Okay. But uh, that, that's going to be a fun movie. Uh, well, Sugar Creek, that's uh, that's actually premiering this week in uh, Westwood, Majestic. Okay. Uh, so that's that's a that's a horror horror film. Also, it's a, a western film set back in the 1800s. But that was a lot of fun. Got to go to Arkansas and uh, do a lot of crazy horse riding. Uh, uh, play a sheriff in that, and uh, looking looking forward to that one also. Let's see what else did you ask me about? Oh, Cosmic Radio. Yeah. <clears throat> Cosmic Radio is a uh, environmental, uh, pro environmental piece about saving saving the uh, the forest. And uh, I play a uh, a logger, <laughs> a, a redneck hick kind of logger, but yeah, a lot of fun. Michael <laughs> Madsen's in it. And Hank. <laughs> I've, I've got I've got chasing. Let's see, chasing three thousand cosmic radio. Did we talk about chasing three thousand? Chasing three thousand is. Uh, I think that's going to be a real cool uh, little movie, also with uh, Ray, Rio, uh, Ray Liotta and uh, uh, oh god, what's the actor's name? <laughs> uh, McCulkin. Ah, uh, yeah, young McCulkin. Uh, I forget. I, I know you're talking about though. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like I said, I've got a call. I haven't been sleeping. I can't think. But uh, <laughs> it's a, a, a nice, uh, a nice little story about two brothers uh, traveling across country to uh, uh, see a ball game. One of them is a crippled little boy. Uh, I play kind of a psychotic, short order cook that they meet along the way. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I don't want to give too much story away, so we'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know you've got tons of other films that you've been in. I want to mention some of them here. G.I. Jane, uh, Con Air, Point Blank, uh, Strangeland, that was the D. Schneider thing. Um, Blow, like I'd, I'd mentioned earlier, The Knockaround Guys, which is actually a pretty decent film. I've seen that. Um, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, you, that was with uh, that's got uh, oh god now I can't now I can't think of the names uh, the big guy um, help me out here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm 
sorry, say that again? Uh, I, I'm trying to think of the guy's name now that, w- that was in Knock Around Guys with you. Uh, Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Vin, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nice guy. Okay, that's cool. Another great guy to work with. Uh, we did a, a fight scene in there, which I think one of the better fight scenes we've ever done on film. And uh, he kicked my ass. <laughs> <laughs> now, I see you were also in Heat. That's, a, that's one of my favorites. Still yeah, he, to this day, my, uh, that's my claim to fame. There, I've, I've been an actor 25 years, and that was the first big. Well, not really. The first big film I did, I think, was The Burbs with Tom Hanks. But you don't really remember me. I I remember. Well, I, I see you played a cop here, but I do remember the film. The film is is yeah. in my collection. <laughs> but uh, Heat was uh, <clears throat> Heat was a real turning point in my career. That was uh, took me two and a half months 11 11 meetings to get that job oh wow uh, you know everybody wanted to wanted to be in that film i bet with, uh, robert de niro and al pacino val kilmer john Foy. you know just an all-star cast so when i got the film it was uh needless to say i was uh euphoric and it, it basically put me on the map as an actor i've been being taken much more seriously casting people producers directors uh, Start giving me a little, little more respect once you work with those caliber people in a, in a Michael Mann film. Oh yeah, uh, and, and the character Wayne Grove was uh, <clears throat> just a godsend. You know, such fun to play guys like that. <laughs> and uh, you know, that big budget film, they spare no expense. So uh, you know, you've got the best tattoo artists working on you, and you know, in the wardrobe and, and the props that just that kind of uh, that kind of budget and directors like Michael Mann, you know, they, they really contribute to uh, bringing those characters to life. You know, actors can only do so much, but uh, when you've got when you're working with those kind of people, they, uh, they 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 really make your characters look bigger than life. That's awesome. Well, yeah. Kevin, I want I want to give you. Uh, we're going to have to wrap this up. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on our Halloween edition. Is there anything else you'd like to say out there to the people listening tonight? Happy Halloween, man. Be careful out there. Don't be uh, biting into any apples with razor blades. and <laughs> <laughs> No stealing your neighbor kid's candy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. Well, Kevin, take care of yourself. All right, Jay. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.